First of all, uh, my speaking style, I really like to hear from all of you. I don't get to go to the UK too often. I'm in Israel, I'm from the United States, and though I've been doing my job for uh, about nine years now, I really like to hear from people uh, on the ground in the UK. So I'm going to be asking a lot of questions, and I want to really get your honest opinion about you know, how you see the British media and how it affects your lives. Uh, so just quickly, I don't know if many of you remember CIF Watch, who you know, UK Media Watch used to be CIF Watch. Well, it was founded in 2009 by a group of volunteers who were appalled at not just the anti-Israel content um, at The Guardian, but also uh, the anti-Semitism, which was uh, below the line in the comments section at Common is Free. So uh, in 2010, they hired me as their only employee, uh, as their managing editor. And uh, you know, after I convinced my wife that there truly is a job getting paid to read The Guardian every day, <laughs> I proceeded to um, focus with the laser beam on The Guardian. And I don't need to tell anybody how bad The Guardian is. But in my nine years... I really believe that those two years from 2010 to 2012 were the worst years. Um, it, it, there was no accountability. They were, there was one period of time where s- um, six in a row op-eds regarding the Palestinian-Israel situation where, public, where the author were, were uh, Islamists who were opposed to the existence of Israel within any borders. Um, it was really a cesspit. And um, we um, found that we got some traction by hammering away. We think we punched above our weight for a small organization with one paid employee. Um, A lot of you here know what it's like to be that one employee. So, uh, but we made some success. I think we kind of gave them a black eye. We we gave them the notoriety that they they deserved and we got a little headway. And in 2012, we decided that there is this media organization you've heard of called the BBC, which is such a large international media organization that we hired one of our volunteers, Hadar Sela, who some of you may know, uh, who lives up there in the Golan and the kibbutz uh, to manage BBC Watch. So, um, and then you know the best news for me professionally is that we merged with Camera, the largest and most prolific pro-Israel media monitoring organization uh, in the English in the English world. And the interesting thing would happen in 2012 when we became part of Camera. We adopted the camera model of media monitoring. We didn't just blog away and uh, tweet away, but we I began contacting editors and journalists directly to try to get them to acknowledge their mistakes and to fix their mistakes. That's the camera method because that's what uh, in, you know, the organization camera was founded in 1982 and I was more than willing to defer to their experience and their judgment and their organizational experience. And we, we feel that that really uh, our game kind of got to, was taken to the next level after that. Um, and then in 2015, uh, there was a period of time when actually the Guardian wasn't quite as bad, um, and I'll get into that later. But so we decided that hey, it's time to focus on the Independent, the Financial Times, the Telegraph, uh, the, the Times, uh, Sky News, ITV, C- and Channel Four. So we changed our name to UK Media Watch. A few of our guiding principles. Um, you know, first, we start off from the premise that there aren't just competing narratives that there are facts in life that through rigorous research and uh, careful thinking you can ascertain and that it's it's the media's job to determine and report truthfully these facts. It's not their job to speak truth to power. It's not their job to be part of the resistance. It's their, it's a sacred duty that um, to, to report the truth accurately in an unbiased fashion. And we believe it's the responsibility of you and us as responsible citizens, in this case, responsible citizens who care deeply about Israel and about Jews, to hold the media accountable um, to accuracy. We believe that the media is biased against Israel in several ways. We feel that there, you can see the bias evidence in their story selection, uh, in the narrative they follow, the facts they get wrong, and the facts that they omit. Uh, people, you know, people always ask us to what degree anti-Semitism motivates uh, the biases of reporters and editors. And I usually answer, and so it's a very important question, interesting question, but, you know, my answer is this. You know, we can never know what's in the hearts of uh, individuals, of, of journalists. Um, and we're very careful to use that term unless they said something that violate, that is within the parameters of the IRA definition. 
So instead, you know, but we do clearly feel that a lot of the bias is motivated by their personal biases. A lot of journalists go into the job and they look at it, look at it as an extension of their activism. You know, their, um, we call it advocacy journalism. Um, and they feel that their duty as quote unquote progressives is to be on the Palestinian side. So we think personal biases is part of it. The acceptance of a facile David and Goliath narrative is part of it. Uh, and also, one of the things I've been posting a lot, and those of you who follow our blog would know, is a failure to impute agency uh, to Palestinians. Um, you've heard the term liberal racism. Liberal racism is when uh, you view minority not as the complex, nuanced uh, people that they are, but um, as an abstraction. The Palestinians, I think, have become an abstraction in the eyes of a lot of the media. And, you know, whereas with Children, um, we don't impute agency. We, we don't hold them morally accountable. Uh, when you do that to an adult, I think that's as egregious a form of racism as any other kind of racism. And, you know, Palestinians in the media are always acted upon. They, they're never seen as actors who make decisions who affect their destiny. And if you just think about that, and next time you read the next article in The Guardian or The Independent about Palestinians, note how infrequently you read about their ideological uh, you know, opinions. Think how often you see uh, the Israeli, Israel described as moving dangerously right, moving to a far right position. When do you ever see a mainstream article that says Palestinian society is moving right or is right or is you know, moving away from, from liberal values? The fact is that you don't. And I think that's a double standard of moral accountability that I think is, is indefensible. Um, and I think this bias distorts the public's understanding of, of the conflict. I think it contributes to the cognitive war against, against Israel. And uh, it fuels anti-Semitism. Now, there was a uh, campaign against anti-Semitism poll in 2016, maybe, which showed that 80%, 82% of British Jews believe that uh, media bias against Israel fuels anti-Semitism in the UK. Uh, we're active on Facebook. Uh, Camera, the organization that we are a part of, uh, ha- does uh, letter campaigns. They, uh, they uh, do billboard campaigns. I don't know if many of you saw, but um, right outside the New York Times office in New York, uh, Camera launched a series of billboards uh, attacking New York Times bias, which um, directly faces their office. And New York Times employees every day wake up and they see these uh, camera billboards. So we'd like, it t- we'd like to take it to them and uh, make them aware of us, whether they want to or not. Like I said, a lot of what we do is, and this is something I would hope that at the end of this um, event that you are more inclined to do if you don't already do it, is we contact, we communicate directly with editors and journalists that challenge false, co- false claims. Uh, and um, we, at times, you know, we also, uh, I've also met with a couple of journalists personally in Jerusalem. I met with um, the Middle East editor of uh, Sky News, supposed to meet with the Jerusalem correspondent of the Financial Times soon. So uh, a lot of what we do is, is just one-on-one is communication, and we hold them accountable to what you know is the, the editor's code. <coughs> what types of errors do we hold them accountable to? Uh, obviously, factual errors. Who here has remembered uh, reading in some British media outlet or some other outlet the claim that there are Jews-only roads in the West Bank? Wow. Now, did anybody like anybody who read that here believe that maybe it's true? Did anybody, uh, was anybody clear about that? I'm just wondering what the British Jewish community, did anybody think that was possibly true? So you knew it was, you knew it was false. Okay, a very stubborn lie that um, has absolutely no basis in reality whatsoever. And uh, media outlets like the Financial Times, the Guardian, the New York Times, Uh, continued to make this error until I think we finally got enough corrections that editors stopped mostly making that claim. Again, as you know, the most insidious thing about this lie is that it fuels the Israeli apartheid lie. So small lies feed the larger lie. And that's one example of the kind of errors that we really go after. Errors of omission. Uh, An article, say, in The Guardian about the diplomatic history between Israel and and the Palestinians that omits, like, the 2008 peace offer by Ulmer, things like that. Double standards, the fact that in British media outlets who consistently use the word terrorism when when referring to terrorist attacks in the UK will never use the word terrorism when talking about suicide bombings in Israel. 
I'm going to give you an interesting example later on about misleading or inappropriate photos, um, which also violate the editor's code. Um, conflating fact with opinion, which is huge. You know, the blurring of news and opinion in, in the media these days um, is, a, is a problem all over, the, all over the media, and that's also sp- spelled out that it's prohibited to do that um, per the accuracy clause of the um, editor's code. And anti-Semitism per the IRA definition. Okay, why corrections matter? Um, some people that are even very friendly to us and support our mission and are passionate about Israel say, eh, like, you know, what does it matter if a little tiny correction is printed on page 37 of The Guardian the following day? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I'm tempted to cheekily respond, you know, hello, the 1970s called, they want their print newspaper back. Um, but by that I mean... Very few people get their print newspaper, um, get their news information on, um, on in the print newspaper. Most people get it online, right? So once that uh, error is corrected online, it's corrected permanently. You know, when people Google that story, when people Google that information, the correct version will be on the internet. Um, so it's not the little you know correction itself that matters. It's the fact that the record was set straight in that article. And if you Google that article, if you Google that information, it'll be it'll be it'll have the correct sentence. It also prevents future claims, future false claims. We think it has a cumulative effect. Uh, we think that, um, like I said with the Jews Only Roads, that as much as the Guardian despises us, and believe me, based on my conversations and emails with editors there, they really do see us as the enemy, um, and we are their enemy. Um, they listen because they have to, because they, um, many times because they feel that they do have a professional responsibility. And oftentimes they don't want their reputation sullied. You know, they, they care about their image. And I would argue that many journalists are especially thin-skinned and don't like to have their um, you know, to, uh, information online that their uh, article was corrected. Uh, so, and also, you know, the fact that they know that they're being watched. You know, there was, uh, Chris Elliott was the Guardian Reader's editor back in 2011. Uh, and he wrote this column in resp- which... Anybody who knew our organization at the time was, even though he didn't mention CIF Watch, was a direct response to us. As he referred to, the, the title of the column was On Averting Charges of Anti-Semitism, which is interesting and it, also an interesting wordplay, right? On Averting Charges of Anti-Semitism, not On Averting Anti-Semitism. But he mentioned groups that read every word of what we write in a way that clearly indicated to me, you know, obviously he was referring to us, and that they know they're being watched. And when they know they're being watched, and this is why I want you all to be more involved in contact media outlets, they're more careful with what they say. Not because they uh, necessarily, you know, want to be your friend, just because, you know, some critical mass of criticism, you know, they're vulnerable to. And also, um, the delegitimization campaign is fooled by falsehoods and the corrections set the record straight. Okay, best practices when complaining. Uh, these might seem straightforward, but you'd be surprised how many times we get CC'd by uh, pro-Israel people. Uh, their letters to journalists or editors that are rant, rants, that are full of ad hominem attacks and accusations that are so counterproductive and so, I think, hurt our reputation, um, the pro-Israel community. So, number one, be concise, get to the point, don't, don't make it real wordy, uh, choose your words wisely, be polite and professional. Um, also, acu- assume good faith. You know, we don't use the word lying that often in our blog or on tweets because, again, that goes into, you know, what's someone thinking in their head, which we don't know. Um, just say, be neutral. Say, you know, this appears to be an error. Uh, don't engage in ad hominem attacks. Don't accuse anyone of being anti-Semitic. If you're going to write a letter or complain that an article um, was anti-Semitic per the IRA definition, Use language such as, this article seemed to evoke anti-Semitic tropes per IRA. Don't say, this journalist is anti-Semitic. The number of times on Twitter we see friends of ours accuse um, journalists of being anti-Semitic, whether or not they are or not, but without any evidence, is, is, uh, it happens quite a bit. Stick to the facts. Uh, be accurate and include a source. Uh, target, you choose your targets wisely. Don't go after Al Jazeera or Electronic Intifada. Go after mainstream media outlets. Um, like I said, I can't say enough. Really, get on Twitter. Try, you know, try to uh, master it and, and do well. Go viral. Um, build relationships with editors and earn respect. Okay, so the accuracy 
accuracy clause of the editor's code is our Bible. Um, shoot, I'm assuming many of you are familiar with it, but just briefly, um, they not only must take care not to publish inaccurate information, including headlines, uh, and they and publish a correction with due prominence, they also um, must distinguish between comment, conjecture, and fact. And that's something that, that you'll see a lot. Okay, The Guardian. Uh, you know, interestingly, The Guardian, un, um, when they were part of, who remembers the Press Complaints Commission, which was the predecessor of Ipso? Okay. So The Guardian used to be under the auspices, under the, uh, you know, the watching eye of, uh, of the Press Complaints Commission, and they were more accountable because they had to be. Uh, for instance, in 2012, I believe it was, uh, the PCC ruled that uh, Guardian was wrong to state as if it was a fact that Tel Aviv is the capital of Israel. Um, you know, I mean, that, that's remarkable that that was even, that was even claimed, um, but the fact that the Guardian was under the PCC made it much easier. There also was a reader's editor by the name of Chris Elliott who uh, didn't like um, our blog or, or didn't like me, but... You know, in hindsight, given their new reader's editor, who I'll get to in a second, he responded to every email I wrote. He weighed the evidence, and he gave me a decision within a day or two. Um, And he even on occasion condemned anti-Semitism in that article I mentioned. And and this is the most interesting, I think, event, like at least in, you know, it's very inside baseball, at least in my, this to me was a defining moment. People here remember this cartoon by Steve Bell and the Guardian? Okay. You know, uh, this was during uh, the 2014 Summer War, uh, Operation um, Protective Edge. And as you see, it depicted BB as a puppeteer controlling the puppets of William Haig, then Foreign Secretary, and Tony Blair, who I believe was the quartet, the head of the quartet. I could be wrong. And yeah, this really just, uh, in a dictionary, a uh, encyclopedia of anti-Semitism, this will, you know, th- this, this would be prominently, fo- uh, pro- prominently displayed. I mean, this evokes their Sturmer, and I don't use that word lightly, cl- classic, which you've seen in the Arab media a lot. Uh, and, you know, it, it, evo- it created, incited a storm of criticism, including by us, but they refused to remove it. However, uh, and I'm not saying it was just us, but a lot of people complained, but we sent, uh, you know, quite a few messages to the reader's editor, and so did CST. And uh, the response was a column by Chris Elliott, again, the Guardian Reader's Editor, which seemed to carefully research the history of anti-Semitism and this trope of Jewish power and Jews controlling uh, the decisions of non-Jewish politicians and came out with a decision that it was indeed anti-Semitic. That cartoonist, he said, I remember his exact quote, but he said cartoonists should avoid evoking anti-Semitism and even um, graphic depictions of anti-Semitic tropes. Uh, now, you might say, so what? Like, what did that impact, impact did that have? I, I think it had a big impact, actually. Um, because as bad as Steve Bell is, and believe me, he is really bad, he hasn't engaged in anything like this since then. I think he'd be less likely to. So, you know, a lot of what I say is um, based on the premise that the perfect is the enemy of the good. So I'm not going to change Steve Bell's mind. I'm not going to convince The Guardian to fire Steve Bell. But if... This is not going to be accepted. The Guardian, to me, that's a win. Okay, so in 2014, the PCC was re- replaced. Uh, they folded after complaints that they were ineffective. And in, in wake of the Le- Levison inquiry, they were replaced by, the, uh, by Ipso. Uh, the Times, the Telegraph, the Daily Mail, and others, most media outlets in the UK opted in. Guardian, Financial Times, disappointingly, and Independent opted out. Uh, the Guardian, in their editorial, uh, arguing why they opted out, st- basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, that they could police themselves, um, which is just so ironic and so inconsistent, given that their entire reason for being is to speak truth to power, right? To hold power accountable, that there should be systems of, you know, of uh, accountability, and. Yeah, and, and they completely you know, sh- show themselves for, to, to the, for the hypocrites that they are. So um, this is where you, know, you should reread your Kafka. Uh, the Guardian set up what they call a Guardian Review Panel, right? So it was supposed to be this independent um, panel, uh, who, the, the, the director of whom could only, I think, be fired by, by Catherine Viner, the editor-in-chief. So it's supposed to be uh, independent, and 
the idea was that if you were dissatisfied with the results of complaining to the reader's editor, you could appeal to the Guardian Review Panel. The problem is that, as I found out um, in this unbelievable series of emails with um, Paul Chadwick, the new reader's editor, you can only appeal to the Guardian Review Panel if your complaint was first rejected officially via email by the reader's editor. So what this means is, if uh, Paul Chadwick, the Guardian Reader's Editor, wants to deny you the right to appeal to the Guardian Review Panel, all he has to do is ignore your email. That's all he has to do. He makes it literally impossible for, for me to go to the Guardian Review Panel to adjudicate a complaint. Simply by ignoring my email, by not saying no, by not officially rejecting it, so you have literally have no recourse. It, it, it's, just, it's, it's a joke, and uh, it makes uh, holding them accountable a lot more difficult. Okay, so Paul Chadwick, again, uh, my new nemesis, uh, has failed to respond to roughly 90% of my complaints. Now, that doesn't mean that if he would respond and if he was held accountable that I would get all those corrected, but you know, he responds periodically in my mind so he could plausibly argue that he doesn't completely ignore us. Um, but you know, I like to think of you know the Guardian, and the title of, of this event is "Are There Any Rules?" At the Guardian, there are no rules. Okay, so like I said, to be heard, I I recommend you email the journalist or tweet the journalist directly. Uh, email the editor. Uh, contact the reader's editor in the case of the Guardian. Uh, the ta- the Times and the Telegraph and the Daily Mail have great online complaint forms that seem to be uh, forwarded to the appropriate editors, and you almost always get a response. So if you go online to most of these media outlets, you'll see how to complain. I mean, I highly recommend using them. Uh, it seems like they take each complaint seriously. And, uh, you know, like I said, especially the organizations that are held accountable under IPSO will respond. And it's a good way to affect change. All right, so in 2018, we facilitated at UK Media Watch 51 media corrections. Um, and um, I think 10 that year came from The Guardian, which um, I'm proud of just considering how hard it was, how hard it is to get uh, corrections at The Guardian. Uh, another source of misinformation in UK Media that is, uh, has increased over the past few years has been The Independent. Um, anyone here familiar enough with The Independent to know how hostile they are? Okay. All right. Um, in fact, last year, was it last? No, it was two, early 2019. Uh, you, you know Robert Fisk, right? Okay, he, he wrote a column that was probably, and again, I'm not exaggerating, in my nine years of doing this work, the most um, blatantly anti-Semitic article I've seen. Robert Fisk in The Independent. Uh, the original headline of the article was uh, something about um, U.S. recognition of, Golan, of the Golan Heights confirms that uh, Israel controls America. Now, that was del- edited after an hour, and it was changed to something, as I like to joke, slightly less uh, horrific. Um, but the fact that that line made it past any editor is phenomenal. However, despite the fact that they changed the, uh, the, t- the headline, the article still contained the line at the end, uh, I might be getting this a little wrong, that uh, Israel now now we know that um, Israel uh, was it controls the U.S. Congress or something like that. It was still something that drew upon classic anti-Semitic trope. Um, so again, since they're not regulated under IPSO, I relied on my relationship with their deputy managing, managing editor Will Gore, who, in fairness, I've developed a good relationship with. Um, and, um, and I, I got a I got a statement from the CST. Uh, however, for reasons, uh, the fact that they're not accountable, and the fact that uh, they they refuse to change, they refuse to make a substantive correction. But like I said, in developing relationships, um, you know, my next meeting is with the Jerusalem correspondent of Financial Times, and I don't know how many of you read the Financial Times. They have a very difficult paywall. Um, but it's interesting because their Jerusalem correspondent actually isn't that bad, but their official editorials are just awful. They can be vicious sometimes. It's a, it has a very anti-Israel stance, and it's a very internationally influential uh, publication. Okay, again, again, like I said, the, the bypassing the editors by using Twitter 
uh, I think is a really great way to, and you know, how we found is a great way to uh, just get, uh, make an impact without having to go through the bureaucracy of the media outlets. Let me give you a couple examples. All right, so this was uh, back in the old days when there, you were limited to 140 characters uh, before they amped it up to 280 characters. Okay, Roy Greenslade. Anyone heard of Roy Greenslade? Okay, he's okay. So he's the Guardian's. He was the Guardian's. I think he was. I think he uh, retired, but he was the Guardian's media uh, blogger. There was a, a bill before the Knesset that included a provision that would have um, banned uh, journalists working for Israeli public radio or Israeli public broadcasters to give a personal opinion. It was called the No Opinion Provision of a New Law. However, you know, if you follow Israeli politics, you know that very often BB will propose, Likud will propose a, a, a law that has a few uh, amendments that get people excited but are later dropped. And this was one of them. This opinion, this provision of the law was dropped before the final version. Roy Greenslade published it as if that uh, provision was still part of the bill. Um, and I simply tweeted him saying, you know, with a source saying, hey, just to let you know that is really law you wrote about, you know, uh, that provision was removed. Uh, no fan of you came in and watched, he thanked me, and he wrote a new blog post um, explaining this updated information. Also, this is uh, an interesting correspondence in that the, the independent correspondent whose name Natasha Kolzak seemed, if you, if you read it, um, again, it was just based on the fact that the article used uh, an anonymous source, simply citing an EU source, to make a baseless claim about God's import restrictions. Um, I pointed out to her with a source there, you can see the link, the, the, the short link, that it was uh, untrue. And if she responds, you know, she seems genuinely uh, repentant, right? I mean, she says she doesn't, she didn't say out to give only one perspective on that matters, apologies. So sometimes just, you know, being polite and getting to the point, using a source, don't use hyperbolic language, it makes an impact. Anyone here familiar with um, Meirav Zonstein? She's an Israeli journalist who contributes for publications like Plus, um, Plus 972, which is an anti-Zionist Israeli publication. But she also publishes for, the, I think, the LA Times, I think, uh, and The Guardian, I think also the New York Times. And she inflated the number of Palestinians held in administrative detention by a huge, by like 12-fold. From the real number 370, she cited 5,442. I alerted her to the error with a source. She thanked me and I corrected the article. Okay, I, I want you to really focus on um, the use of language in media bias is sometimes almost comical. Um, what's the first thing that... Tell me, based on the photo and based on the headline, this is in Euronews, uh, what you think happened if you didn't know a thing. Just read the language... And then you see the photo. Well, it's actually a video, but the screen caption is from the video. And, and, you know, it certainly looks like the Israelis are at fault here, doesn't it? Like, okay, well, in actuality, what happened was during 2015, 2016, during the period known as, I think, the Knife Intifada, there was a series of car ramming attacks, you remember. And this was just a case of a Palestinian terrorist who, I think, unsuccessfully tried to ram Israeli soldiers, and they shot back and... Uh, they killed the driver. So I contacted the editor of Euro News. <laughs> you know, again, 140 characters back in the old days. Um, simply saying, you know, trying to explain the driver was the terrorist who rammed the soldiers, right? Um, again, I'm always interested, you know, fascinated again by, uh, I mentioned before the importance of not imputing bad faith. I'm not making it hominem attacks. And look at, if you look at his response, like, first of all, it came in a personal message, not a public tweet. From bottom to top, you know, he said, thanks for spotting this. The title will be corrected ASAP. Um, I said, thanks. And he said, sometimes a rush script can go wrong, which is a reasonable response, and there's no reason not to believe him. Um, and if you look at the corrected headline, do we all agree that's much clearer? I mean, you know, it isn't a complicated story, but, uh, you know, the interplay between... Um, the headline, the photograph, and the article is a huge part of, uh, you know, and how they sell the article. Okay, who here remembers Samir Kuntar? Okay. Um, in 1979, um, this Lebanese terrorist 
committed one of the most brutal terrorist acts in Israel history. Um, he killed a family of four, including two, 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 um, two children. The one child who I think was four, he killed after he, he killed his, his parents by um, ram smashing his head up against a rock with the butt of his rifle. Um, you know, as much as we get numb in uh, reading about and experiencing terrorist attacks in Israel, this one just always, as a father of two girl, young girls, it just, the evil is unimaginable. So at some point, if you recall, he was released in a prisoner exchange swap, I believe in 2010, I could be wrong. Uh, and what's that? I'm not sure. 2006, you think, really? Okay. Um, I th- either way, yeah, you might be right, yeah. So when he, and then he was killed, presumably by Israel. Um, take a look at the photo they chose for this article. What's the first thing that you notice? All right, but what about the two children? How's it? Well, the fact that Samir Kuntar, who murdered children with his bare hands, was seen as a family man. I think the headline, my headline when I posted about it was, Guardian portrays the, you know, uh, child-friendly child killer. Um, There's just no example you could possibly think of where a terrorist who committed a, a murderous attack on British soil, once he was killed by, say, British troops or whatever, or by police, would be depicted this way. This, this is just obscene that they would depict him with his arms around two young children. Um, and it just, you know, it's one of those things you see it just infuriating. And again, this was, um, you know, uh, once the Guardian became uh, um, unaccountable. And I thought about taking it to the reader's editor and decided instead, okay, wait a minute, who's really responsible for this photo? I did some digging, and I found, okay, there's a picture editor, a photo editor. Maybe I can get her attention. So I emailed her and tweet. Just before you, yeah. the, the uh, caption is also interesting. Qatar was reviled in Israel for a 1979 attack that killed four people. Yeah. He didn't kill the four people. Yeah. It was just That's good. Attack. That's a good catch. I don't think I, I think I was just so shell-shocked by that photo. I think I didn't notice that caption, but that, that's good. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so I tweet, if you look on the left, this is my tweet to Fiona Shields, I believe her name is, uh, the photo editor, and I simply said, can you please explain this decision to use this photo to depict a terrorist who murdered a four-year-old girl? Um, the tweet uh, ended up getting hundreds of retweets, uh, got her attention. She thanked me for pointing it out and agreed that it was a misleading photo. She changed it to something more generic, you know, um, which is fine. Um, you know, I think that was an interesting success because, again, like we said, the photo is... Yeah, go ahead. It's also changed, as Jonathan just said, look, as he's now responsible, convicted of carrying out a notorious... Where does it say convicted? Oh, that was the subtitle. Wait, hold on. Wait, hold on. Oh, you're right. Wow, you guys uh, are good. <laughs> but, but the writing... What's that? The writing beneath the photo, though, the, ca- still, the caption. Yeah. Kuntar, Kuntar an attack that Kuntar. killed. Yeah. An attack that killed that he doesn't necessarily commit. Right, but you're right in that convicted of carrying out is an improvement in this in this in the strap line. Mm-hmm. Good catch. All right. Cool. I like to say that that's such really that's good eyes. Uh, also, again, in the spirit of, of assuming good faith, remember when I think Boris Johnson, I believe when he was mayor, he took a tour of Israel and the Palestinian territories, right? In 2015, he was mayor, I believe. Yeah, so uh, if you remember the, the row over the fact that uh, he made this statement against BDS when he was on that tour, and he was obviously condemned roundly by the Palestinians, he was actually... Banned, disinvited from a uh, NGO forum called the Palestinian Business Women's Forum. But during that same trip, um, the uh, the Palestinians also banned um, this uh, Jewish journalist. I believe she was affiliated with the Jewish Chronicle. 
simply because she had Israeli citizenship. Now, you think that um, a journalist, journalist would rally behind another journalist who was barred from attending an event simply because of her nationality or religion. And I asked why she didn't cover, you know, the, the story about the journalist. And her answer is just kind of like funny in a way, like, well, I didn't know. <laughs> Um, so again, it's just a matter of, you know, as, as you know, a lot of what we do is, at, at CAM or UK Media Watch is we're news junkies, right? We're reading the news all the time about everything, but mostly about Israel and Palestinians. But we should assume necessarily that just because we read something in, say, the Jewish Chronicle, that the journalist um, for The Independent read the same thing.